Yeah. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our weekly Egyptology and Assyriology seminar at Brown. Uh, it is great to see uh, so many of you. Thank you for uh, joining us today. Um, so you should all be muted uh, by, by now, but we'll try to uh, keep you muted until uh, the end of the talk so that we avoid any interference with the sound. So the seminar lasts an hour and will finish at 1 p.m. So there will be some time for questions at the end of the talk. You'll be able to use the raise hand function or the chat section to ask your questions. So we have uh, the great pleasure to have today a presentation from Professor De Manuelian. Professor De Manuelian is Barbara Bell Professor of Egyptology in both the, Eastern, uh, the Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations and the Anthropology Department at Harvard University, as well as Director of the Harvard Museum of the Ancient Near East. He was previously on the curatorial staff of the Museum of Fine Arts Boston. He is also director of the Giza project at Harvard, um, which I'm sure uh, most of you are aware of, a project that aims to collect and present online all past, present, and future archaeological activity at the Giza pyramids. It is a wonderful uh, website which offers a lot of resources such as digitalized archives, but also a visit of the site, pyramid complexes, individual mastaba, and so on through 3D reconstruction. Professor de Manuelian also brought interactive experiences of Giza with realistic 3D visualization of the site to his classroom at Harvard. He is indeed interested to find ways to include visualization and digital humanities approaches to the ancient world. His publication um, ranges from digital Giza to 30 second ancient Egypt, where each topic is aimed to be covered in 30 seconds, studies in the reign of Amenophis II, as well as children's book. He also published extensively about the Giza necropolis through articles and monographs, and I'll just uh, mention a few. The self Stila of the Giza necropolis, uh, published in 2003, Mestaba of Nuclear Century, G2100, Part 1, which was published in 2009. And it is about his work at Giza that he will speak today with the following paper, Decolonizing Marison at Giza. So thank you so much, Professor Germanielian, for joining us today. Thanks, Krista. Thank thanks, you. Catherine. <laughs> and thanks to everyone at the seminar at Brown. It's a pleasure to be with you. I miss that drive down 95 and parking in Providence and being with you physically, but uh, Zoom has its advantages too. So thanks to everyone for joining at, uh, at this time, wherever you are and whatever time it is. So I'll jump right in since I usually have too many slides and I'll try to fit in with our, uh, our time frame. And the year is 1927, and this is the 83rd day of work of the Harvard University Boston Museum of Fine Arts Expedition. Everyone is exhausted because they've spent the last two years 90 feet underground working in tomb 7000X, the burial chamber of Queen Hedda Paris I. So uh, this is the last day of the field season when some interesting discoveries were made. Just a quick warning, I'm going to be showing some images of human remains in the coming slides, and I hope that that won't be too, uh, too disturbing for anyone in the audience. So always a good idea to meet the players and the and, uh, people on the team here, and most important, of course, is the Rais. Uh, in this case, it's Rais Mahmoud al Mayat, Mahmoud the corpse, because he fell into a coma as a youngster and miraculously came out of it again. He had just lost his brother, Reisner's best, uh, most effective Rais, uh, Syed Ahmed Syed, so he has taken over now uh, the excavations. And you see him in these photographs, those uh, limestone blocks in the little hut behind them, those are actually the blocks that came from the filling of the shaft G7000X of Hedda Paris there. So just an interesting little tidbit. So he's the Rias. We also have British archeologist, Lieutenant Commander Noel Wheeler, who worked for Reisner from the mid 1920s until the early 1930s and was uh, integral in this season as well. You can see him uh, on his belly there in the tomb of uh, Hedda Paris uh, just before the period that we're covering. And then a young archaeologist from a very well-to-do Buffalo family named Phelps Clausen. You can see him here in various images and also as an older man in the lower right. He was so handsome that he was a model for the 107th Infantry Memorial statue in New York at East 57th and 5th. Go and see that if you have a chance. 
But he had a lot of things on his mind out at Giza here. Uh, he wasn't without his challenges, such as recovering from a failed marriage to a Russian actress, Valia Vinitskaya, that hit all the gossip papers in Buffalo. So he, maybe he was at Giza to try to escape the scenario. Anyway, back to the excavations. April 24, 1927 is the day after the discovery of the tomb of Marisank, this very unusual subterranean painted decorated chapel underneath the core of the mastaba. And here are some of the very first views inside the chamber, and you can see the wind blown and rain-driven sand uh, streaming in through the entrance there in these um, glass plate negative photographs. And then the contraption that was necessary to try to remove the stone sarcophagus from the burial shaft and chamber underneath the painted chapel, quite an operation here. And then one year later, Reisner was giving tours, such as to the Crown Prince of Sweden in 1930 that you see. So in our new and ever improving and ever forthcoming Giza website, we're trying to give different modes of access, not just searching for tombs, but also visualizations, uh, 3D maps and plans and models and things. And you see one of the operations here called Giza 3D, where you can view the site from above and choose selected monuments, such as the tomb of Marisank, and we can zoom in and then uh, go inside. The nature of the preservation of some of these tombs determines what we can do with them in terms of restoration or restoring ancient colors and things like this. So here we're just cruising around inside the model and you'll notice we can switch between the 3D model and the photogrammetry, the Matterport camera 3D production of the, uh, the chapel itself. And heading over to this area of the west wall, this is where we're going to spend most of our time and most of our focus for the tomb, that unusual figure that you see on the left-hand side there. 3D modeling can give us some interesting advantages and allow us to ask some new research questions, such as we can track the sunlight in through the window of the chapel from the outside, which seems to shoot right through that entranceway and hit and illuminate the sacred space of the false door on the west wall. And that turns out to be one of several such examples at tombs at Giza, so something worth, uh, worth pursuing. But our focus will be, as I mentioned, on these figures, actually just one figure here. This is the mother of Marisank, Hedda Paris II. Marisank stands behind with a leopard skin, uh, animal skin, and uh, her son Nebem Aket behind her. And of course, the interesting feature here is this so-called yellow wig, hair, whatever you want to call it, with the red outlines, the red curls here. And maybe if you look closely, you can make out here just the curve of this red line. If this is meant to be a wig, are we supposed to interpret the yellow towards her forehead and brow as uh, wisps of natural hair underneath? I leave you to, uh, to debate that point. Well, just a few days after the discovery, Reisner wrote a letter home to the assistant director at the MFA and declared on the wall, the mother of the owner is represented with blonde hair, the only blonde ever found in the pyramid age. And a few days later, in a more formal communique to the MFA, he talked about how uh, she was with short hair painted a bright yellow crossed by fine red horizontal lines. The lady was manifestly blonde or red-haired, the first of either type to be found among the black-haired people of the Pyramid Age. Before the year was out, he'd written an MFA bulletin article, and we read there, underlined in red, that Marisank's mother may have been a fair-haired Libyan from the Western Desert. So lots of conclusions being left to here, and there's a lot of history behind all of this. Where does this association come from? Well, I think in an admirable display of interdisciplinary archaeology, Reisner was interested in examining and preserving everything he found. And in the early years, he pulled in Grafton Elliott Smith and then Douglas Derry for the anatomical analysis of his burials. And that was at Nagader, that was down at the Nubian Archaeological Survey, and then Giza as well. Where they went with their finds, of course, is what became problematic because they were putting a lot of emphasis on crania and skull size as a way to measure intelligence and then, of course, origins. They all got very interested, too, eventually, in the reserve heads coming from Giza and were interested in trying to compare skulls from the same tomb that would contain a reserve head. Uh, unfortunately, there are only a couple of them that preserve both. But uh, this was an interest that uh, caught Reisner's attention as well. And of course, he noticed some of the Syro-Palestinian import wares that were found in some of the mastabas. And so before long, in 1913, he was writing to Grafton Elliott Smith, the pottery coming from the pits is also of a remarkable character. I'm inclined to think part un-Egyptian. 
I think the anatomical material, the archaeological and the chemical, will lead to a very remarkable historic conclusion on the foreign races at Giza, and that it ought to be tied up in a joint monograph. We could even have it ready by next fall. What do you think about it? Trying to figure out who these people are and following Smith and Derry and trying to make a break between the skulls from pre-dynastic burials and the skulls from dynastic periods and also at Giza, this was what produced a sort of vacillation over the following decades. Where did these different peoples, this so-called different race or dynastic race, come from? Did they come from the East or did they come from the West? And of course, what no one was talking much about was indigenous African cultural origins and development, which is the much more likely case, of course. And this blind spot would lead to a host of misinterpretations and really some pretzel logic going forward. In 1915, Reisner wrote in an MFA Bulletin article, this is the most we can say. The road was open, but there's no definite clue at present to the actual origin of the, quote, foreign race at Giza, only a vague indication of an Asiatic origin. Well, race studies and cranium size were among the reasons that Hermann Juncker left excavations in Nubia and traded places in 1911 and 12 with Georg Steindorf up at Giza to try to excavate some of the Giza necropolis alongside Reisner. And with his own religious background, Juncker was eventually using Egyptology as a kind of tool for the historic legitimation of Catholicism, believe it or not. Later on, uh, working at Marimda in the 1930s, he even brought in the uh, prehistorian um, from Vienna, Oswald Mengen, to assist him in the excavations there, and then some of these Nordic interpretations for the origins of the burials they were finding really took off. They were emphasizing the breeding of pigs and the use of spoons and the Nordic character for these Marimda people, and they're going off in another tangent altogether. So we have originally Petrie's dynastic race, this difference between pre-dynastic Egyptians and dynastic ones, and originally coming in somewhere from Europe, but thanks to all the biblical studies influence on early Egyptology, they must have come in through Mesopotamia, from the Levant, in other words, from the East. But then some scholars seem to be troubled by the, quote, Semitic connections of this route, and so another path of origin had to be found from the West, from Libya. So just a couple of uh, quotes here. Derry writing to Oric Bates, an assistant of Reisner's in 1915, believing as I do rightly or wrongly that the pre-dynastic people were not the ancestors of the pyramid builders. If measurements are worth anything, they certainly were not, as I think I have proved. Rex Engelbach, writing later in 1943, said, I consider the balance of probability is that the dynastic race arrived in Egypt as a horde perhaps after a considerable amount of peaceful penetration had already taken place. And then times have changed. After World War II, this Nordic Aryan origin theories were pretty much discredited, and so you see Derry coming back to the East for his origin story. The unexpected discovery was made that the pyramid builders were a different race from those people whose descendants they had hitherto been supposed to be. Naturally, after making this discovery, I was asked where the invaders had come from. We are then left with the East as the most probable region from which an invasion could take place. This is 1956, so the pendulum is swinging back and forth. Bottom line, indigenous African development in Egypt and Nubia out of the question as a source of high civilization. So it's key to remember who's talking, what their agendas are, and most importantly, what the context is and what decade we're talking about pre-World War I, after World War I, between the wars, World War II, or after. And I just love this uh, quote here from Derry. This was Reisner trying to show him the human remains from the largest mastaba at Giza in the Western Cemetery, G20, G2000. And uh, Derry wrote to him in 1935, I'm not surprised that this man had a large mastaba. He must have been full of brains. I would give a lot to know where these people came from. So brain size, skull size, intelligence, origins, they must have come, obviously, from somewhere else. One of Reisner's finds prior to finding Marisanka in 1927, for him, helped clinch the sort of Western or Libyan connection. And this was in Nubia. This is the stela of Tabiri from El Kuru, uh, one of Pianchi's queens. And down in line five, he thought he could read uh, the queen's name as the great one of the Chemhu 
or other than otherwise known as the Libyans. I think a better reading of this would be to take that chaset sign seriously, and maybe we have the chasetiu, desert or mountain dwellers, instead, which kind of wipes that uh, interpretation off the map. But for Reisner, this was confirmation. Now, just to refute all of this so we can set the record straight, we'll jump fast forward in time to later years, and William Stevenson Smith and others had to set these interpretations of Marisank and her blonde hair aside. In 1949, Hesbach, The History of Egyptian Sculpture and Painting, came out, and Smith wrote the color represented is yellow, and the red cross lines are simply the usual red drawing lines common on yellow objects. And then in the second volume, the Head of Paris volume of Giza Necropolis, he wrote that red lines across the yellow surface of her headdress must be interpreted as conventional drawing lines, a wig, Un and it's unsafe to give an ethnic interpretation to the yellow coloring. So he had to bid adieu to the romantic legend of Reisner's red-haired queen. And then by the early 70s, when Dunham and Simpson published The Tomb of Marisank, they said it was generally accepted now that the yellow wig does not imply that the queen had blonde hair. So this interpretation has been set aside in most of the literature that uh, this is a wig, they're red lines, they're guidelines, uh, and Hedda Paris II was indeed an Egyptian. But that is not the point of uh, the talk today. I wanted to point out how these somewhat nefarious interpretations seeped into the scholarship and then into the popular press and then into the literature and some other um, fascinating corridors and corners of, uh, of writing on the subject. Phelps Clausen comes back into the picture in 1928 and publishes an article in Panorama magazine, something he was actually involved with starting, and right on the title there, The World's First Blonde. How interesting that Nefertiti gets chosen as the title, as the cover image, although she has nothing to do with this. This is an account of the discovery of the tomb, and Phelps was there, of course. And uh, it seems that no one could quite let go of Hedda Paris II's blondness or redness. And given this historical context and backdrop, now we can start to see why. And in that drawing in the article, it's kind of interesting. They're down in the burial shaft now, and they're viewing the sarcophagus, one that seems to provide some evidence that Marisank may have predeceased her mother, Hedda Paris II, and tomb assignments may have actually been changed accordingly. Interesting how this drawing matches exactly one of the glass plate expedition negatives taken down there in 1927, right down to the dish-shaped canopic jar lid that's on the floor, the stones propping up the sarcophagus lid, even the staining on the back wall that you see in the chamber. And how it looks today is pretty similar, right down to the staining on the back wall. The sarcophagus, of course, is gone. It's in the Cairo Museum today. This chamber, incidentally, was also the hiding place in the early years of World War II when the fear was that Rommel and the Germans were coming over the hills from the west, and so thousands of glass plate negatives were secretly stored down here under cover of night for a period of many, many months until the danger was gone. So off into the press, this story floated out, Reisner's interpretations of this blonde or red-haired woman being a Libyan, and I apologize for the bad condition of some of these uh, clippings. They're taken from various places and not in the greatest shape, and COVID has stopped me from getting better scans. Some of them aren't even dated, but Mystery of Egypt's First Red-Headed Queen and amazing stories of Viking intermarriages and things to emphasize this Nordic connection that would somehow explain Hedda Paris's coloring. Here's another one, Tomb of Queen Marisant Gives Up Secrets of Ancient Egypt, and the side story is Royal Mother of Monarch Was a Blonde. And yet another one here, Unearthing the Portrait of Egypt's Blonde Queen. Why is this gaining such a popular reception, of course? Well, I think you know the answer is this focus on Egyptians as not being indigenous Africans, but having a Western and European and Mediterranean, and in this particular interpretation, a Libyan root or a Libyan connection. Reisner's friend, the very uh, talented Boston painter Joseph Lyndon Smith, arrived at Giza, as he did almost every year, to help paint some of the discoveries and some of the scenes. And he worked in Marisank as well, created a whole series of paintings that you see here. And he was either choosing or told to focus on Head of Paris as well, so he did a full-length painting of the entire figure that you see on the left, and you can compare it for accuracy with the photograph inset there on the right. And the articles when he came home, again, played up the story a little bit. 
uh, in this particular write-up. A little bit of indigeneity seems to be peeking through in the quotes about no other Egyptian monarch has been discovered to have had light hair, and some of them are distinctly Negroid in characteristics. So we get a little bit of a, of a hint there. But then back to the more expected form, we read on, and it says, our Nordic Omaniacs will probably have it that Hedda Paris was a granddaughter of Queen Hild, strayed from her northern habitat and wedded to a swart African. So again, these blendings of the scholarship, the MFA bulletin articles, the interpretation, the popular press. Hermann Juncker bought into all of these foreign connections, and you can see quotes in his first volume of his lengthy Giza series from 1929, and later in an article from 1932. And just my quick English translations, blonde or red-haired could have derived from a foreign princess whom Khufu married. Exotic garment could also point to foreign origin of this family branch. He's referring to the very pointed uh, shoulders. They're sort of cropped off in this image, but at the left and the right, the unusual nature of her garment. And Hedda Paris probably derived from the marriage of Cheops with a foreign, perhaps Libyan princess. A Libyan king may also have sent his daughter to Cheops from afar. So the lines are blurring between the popular press, the scholarship of the time, and yes, even some fiction. And that takes us off into some weird and wild territory here. I will bet that you don't know that the ever serious and workaholic reputation Reisner actually wrote fiction. And he even wrote a musical or a play or an opera, whatever you want to call it. This was in 1928, one year after the Marisant discovery. And it was called Cheops, or alternatively, in some of the drafts, The Enchanted Age. For this, he teamed up with a British playwright and producer named Ethel Beale, and they were off trying to get this thing produced in one way or another, eventually even turning to California and hoping for uh, feature length films with some of the great studios at the time. For Reisner, it was basically about raising money, but the biological backstory is always present. The opening scene is about, what else? Fundraising. There's old archaeologist Professor Steingruber. That's Reisner's stand-in, obviously, his character. He's sitting at Mina House Hotel by Giza with rich patrons, Mr. and Mrs. Goldfish from Chicago. And Reisner wrote to Ethel Beale, Herewith I send you a note on your first scene with some suggestions for the end. Please do not take it ill that your professor needed a little revamping in his attempt to interest the millionaire. I write from experience with millionaires. Well, that is certainly true. Uh, whether that uh, intro is kept or not, then we go back into the Fourth Dynasty, and here are some of the main players involved in this play or this opera. You will recognize some of them from the Fourth Dynasty, and some of them you won't. Basically, we have two branches of Khufu's family, interestingly titled the Whites on one hand, and the Reds, that's the Libyan branch over on the right there. So Libyan chief Tamashek here isn't able to defeat Khufu militarily, so he has a plan B, which is to sneak his lovely daughter Libya into the royal court and get Khufu's attention and marry him, which is successful. Meanwhile, the whites, the normal Egyptian branch, has Queen Nebhotep over here and giving birth to some of the people that you would recognize uh, from Fourth Dynasty history. Well, Khufu and Libya have Hedda Paris II, the red-haired one, bringing this red or blonde strain into the uh, the royal court family. Jedef Ray is there as well. We've got some interesting sides, like poor Ankaf, who's being blackmailed by Libya. Why? Because Libya has found out what really went on in the tomb of Hedda Paris I, G7000X, and how the body of the queen must have been mutilated and no one told Khufu and Ankaf is in on the plot and so Libya has got her, got him doing her bidding. And there's a princess uh, in hidden disguise from Crete. She teams up with Khafre and eventually they save the day, etc. So it's quite a convoluted story, but Reisner is basically riffing off his interpretation of Fourth Dynasty history. The cast is all there. And there are even musical numbers, such as my personal favorite, who can forget this timeless classic, When Father Fought the Troglodytes, sung as a duet, no less, by Horjedef and Khufu's third wife, Henutsen. So we have these Chemahu Libyans, we have the red-haired daughter of Tamashek named Libya, also described uh, with a necklace of green beads, just like we saw on the wall of Marisank. Uh, Libya and Khufu gave, gave birth to uh, Jedef Ray. 
and onward. And Kawab in there gets murdered as part of the plot for uh, the, red fa- the red side of the family to take over. Interesting stories. And it doesn't end there. We get other people involved, too, in promulgating this sort of uh, Libyan, Western, light-haired, Nordic uh, origins of the Egyptian people. A well-known author and composer and violinist from Maine named Elise Fellows White writes this poem here to the blonde queen, Hedda Paris II. And I've just un- underlined a few of the, uh, of the phrases here. With sun gold hair, flower of the Northland, a pale snow queen, Scythian skies, North Sea waves, etc. So you start to get the idea. We also have the acclaimed National Book Award winning American journalist and novelist uh, Vincent Sheehan, who published in Cosmopolitan this amazing fiction story called The Red-Haired Queen. And guess what that's all about? It says really something. It's uncertain whether Sheehan interviewed Reisner at Harvard camp or whether he just gleaned the, uh, the mostly accurate description he gives of Marisank's tomb from the published reports. But the underlying story certainly relies on Reisner's less than substantiated theories on intrigue and murder among the royal family of the Fourth Dynasty. Sheehan updated this somewhat sordid Fourth Dynasty history and he grafted it onto a modern socialite couple. The wife, whose name is Antoinette, she becomes intrigued at learning that she is a spitting image resemblance of Hedda Paris II, and she insists on visiting the tomb at Giza. After that, she falls into a trance-like state, dressing and imitating the red-haired queen in all manner of Egyptian styles, and she... Oops, it says I am muted. Peter, I'm sorry. Please unmute yourself. Mm. Peter, can you unmute yourself? I am unmuted. Where did you lose me? How far back? There we are. Just at, uh, a, a minute ago, not even a minute ago. Okay, let me see if I can back up a little bit. Interesting. I wonder when that happened. Okay, so I was talking about this author, uh, Vincent Sheehan, uh, and whether he interviewed Reisner. And uh, this story is about a modern socialite couple, and the wife is named Antoinette, and she's intrigued at learning that she resembled Hedda Paris the second, and uh, she insists on visiting the tomb. After that, she falls into a trance-like state, dressing and imitating the red-eared queen and all kinds of Egyptian dress, and then she tries to enlist her brother, get it, to help assassinate her husband, just as Hedda Paris and Jedef Ray had, according to Reisner, assassinated Khufu's eldest son, Kawab. Quite a story. And uh, the illustrations go along too. You can see the pointed uh, garments here in the drawing, and then this next one that shows Antoinette in the tomb, stunned and in trance-like state, gazing at the figure of uh, Hedda Paris II on the wall. She eventually snaps out of this trance, claims it was all just a bad dream, and the married couple live happily ever after in Copenhagen. And, quote, they'd throw you out of the house if you so much as mentioned Egypt. So the story left a bad taste. However, her brother ends up studying to become an Egyptologist, so I guess the field got the last laugh after all. And then that brings us uh, towards the, uh, the end of these recountings of, uh, of how the blonde head of Paris really took off in Reisner and other people's imaginations. This is a photograph that I stumbled on many, many years ago, and I wondered what on earth is going on. And as I did more research, I realized that the man in the hat with Reisner there is Abe Schechter, the director of NBC News Division. And in 1938, he's come to Egypt to try to make a live radio broadcast from the pyramids. Actually, that's his plan B. He was more interested in the royal family and didn't get permission to, uh, to do the interviews that he wanted. So he came up with this one instead. And what's happening is this is sort of a dress rehearsal up at Harvard camp at Giza, where the men have been enlisted to bring their tools and make scraping noises as background sound effects for an excavation, much like NPR radio these days has all the special effects when anyone does reportage from the field. And so they get ready for this broadcast, and it's going to be at 11 p.m. Uh, in February, so a cold February. That's why you see everyone in their overcoats, and they're right outside the north face of the Great Pyramid, and miles of cable go from Mina House Hotel to here, and from here inside the King's Chamber, where another uh, anchorman is ready to do some narrating from there as well. 
I actually dug this recording out. It exists and got it digitized many, many years ago. George Reisner speaks on it. Salim Hassan is there speaking. Walter Brian Emery, William Stevenson Smith, and Reisner's daughter Mary, who by this time is quite an accomplished philologist herself. And I will play you this long quote. It's a little bit tough to hear because it's an old recording. And the, uh, the anchorman starts by asking her to recite a story, but you'll have to follow along with the text there. It's pretty convoluted, but it's based on everything we've been seeing up to this point. The historical implications, the Libyan connections, the murder and the intrigue of the Fourth Dynasty. Well, that would mean an unusual story that your father had uncovered at the pyramid. I remember one story vividly, the story of the red haired queen. She was queen out of Paris, and we knew she was red-haired from the colored portrait found in the tomb of her daughter, Marathon. This lady was married to the eldest son of the brother of the Great Pyramid. His mother had been the chief queen of Sheol. You see, each king had more than one queen in those days. But to continue with the story, a lesser wife of Sheol, who brought the red hair and all the trouble into the family, had a son who aspired to the throne. His name was Ray Dedef, and he was the brother of the red-haired lady. And now comes this ancient story of intrigue as we reconstruct it from the inscription. At the death of the old king, Sheop, the crown prince who should have succeeded to the throne was apparently murdered. In order to keep the red-haired lady quiet, her relatives married her to Ray Dedeth. But her troubles were not over. Ray Dedeth, who had now become king, gave the red-haired lady only second place in his harem. And the red-haired queen discovered that her own son could never be king, as the number one queen's son by Ray Dennis would be the heir to the throne. It's all a bit complicated, I know. It's all history. At the terrace, the red-haired lady began to brood. She would now be the queen mother, the top rung in the ancient social ladder. What happened right after that, we don't know. The results, we do. The second husband, the head of Paris, disappeared suddenly. A new king came to the throne, and the reigning queen thought to her her own daughter married this ruler. Catherine, my friend Catherine, who brought the second pyramid. And so the red-haired lady became the mother-in-law of the king of Upper Nor Egypt. And while some mothers were determined to marry off their daughters, I'm sure none of it was such violence as the red-haired lady. And maybe that's how the present day belief started, that red-haired ladies have a temper. Got it? Are you ready for the quiz? With apologies to all red-haired women out there who may be in the audience. So summarizing all of this, east or west, where did this supposed uh, dynastic race of Giza Egyptians come from? East or west, but of course never indigenous, and that's the crux of the whole problem, of course. So we start with the focus, the overemphasis on cranial measurements, dynastic versus pre-dynastic races. Petrie jumped on board, Smith, Derry, Reisner, Juncker, and others, and of course we could go on and on with Glidden and, and others in this country. Is there a dynastic race at Giza, and where did it come from? Was it from the Levant? The light comes from the east, the biblical connections, of course. This was the prevailing theory early on. Petrie favored it. But then to avoid the Semitic connections, the origins shift to the other side, to the Libyans. So from Europe to the Mediterranean to Libya and into Egypt, the light comes from the north. Georg Muller, Juncker, Steindorf, Alexander Scharf, Heinrich Schaefer, many people jumped onto this uh, theory as well. For Reisner, the El Kuru stele pops up then uh, at, at, of uh, Tabiri, and there are even attempts to link the C group with the Libyans. That's something that his assistant, Oric Bates, was very interested in. You can read that in one of the appendixes of his uh, The Eastern Libyans publication. In 1927 comes our discovery of Marisanx's tomb, the blonde, red-haired Hedda Paris II, inside the, uh, the painted burial chamber of the chapel. Not the burial chamber, but the decorated chapel. And the myth expands, as we've seen from there, in both the scholarship and in the popular press. Everything from plays <coughs> to radio broadcasts to MFA bulletin articles to Juncker scholarly articles to newspaper story after newspaper story. And then, of course, after World War II, the Nordic Western Libyan route serves, the, sorry, during World War II, this northern route serves the cause of Nazi propaganda as well, of course. 
and it's only after the war that that gets discarded and focus shifts back to the Levant. All of it not making an awful lot of sense. Indigenous Egyptian development, of course, is a much more logical and, uh, and obvious understanding of these Egyptians, both at Giza and elsewhere, dynastic or pre-dynastic or what have you. So despite all of Reisner's stellar contributions to archaeological method, to Egyptian and Nubian history, documentation, best practices, all of that, he was never able to quite let go of this Libyan connection. And you see the quote here from his last major work. This is the Giza Necropolis, ostensibly published in 1942. Uh, he saw it in proof galley form, but then died. And the book really didn't come out until 1946, after the war was over. But he said, I attribute the accession of Rajedef, of the Libyan line of Cheops' descendants, to the murder of the eldest son, Prince Kawab, of the legitimate Egyptian branch of the family. And so much of his historical reconstruction and the sort of nefarious racism that's lurking behind it comes right back to this wall, right to this yellow wig, and to its curious red outlines. Thanks very much. <laughs>